Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, today the goal for discussion is to talk about continuous functions, differentiable functions, uh, functions of multiple variables and how do we differentiate those functions and chain rule, Taylor series, mean value theorem and so on. But all for functions of multiple variables. So we have a function So f is a function from, for now let's look at r into r. Uh, we'll try to look at more general cases later on. So f is continuous at x bar if and only if, this is the definition. For every sequence, xk such that xk converges to x bar, f of xk converges to f of x bar. So I pick a sequence around the point x bar, and I can pick pick any sequence, I can pick any sequence, any, it has to be an arbitrary sequence. And the sequence converges to x bar, then the function value over that sequence also converges to the function value at the limit. That is one way to define continuous functions. Okay, any questions? How many of you have seen this definition of continuity before? Few people, okay. So I have a point x bar. I have a function defined over the entire space. And I pick a sequence. This is one sequence. I can pick another sequence, which is like this. I can pick another sequence which goes like this. And no matter what sequence I pick, if I look at the function value, the function value should also converge to the function value at x bar. So f is continuous at x bar if and only if for every sequence xk such that xk converges to x bar, f of xk should also converge to f of x bar. And now a function is continuous if it is continuous at all points in space. So f is continuous if f is continuous at all points in Rn. Are you able to see it? Uh, I'll try to write on top. So f is continuous if f is continuous at all points in Rn. Okay, if, if it is continuous everywhere, then we call it a continuous function. What about differentiability? Okay, so let's try to define differentiable functions. Differentiable functions. So remember we were talking about EI, which is uh, a unit vector in the ith dimension. This is the ith position. 
So I have a function f which is defined, o uh, defined over an n-dimensional space. So the way to define the derivative in the ith dimension is as follows. I am going to take the derivative with respect to xi of f at x bar. This is limit h goes to 0. So I'm, this is my function f. I want to differentiate only with respect to the ith component of x. And I'm going to evaluate it at x bar. This is the way to define the derivative of the function. I'm, of course, assuming the function is differentiable if this limit exists. If the limit does not exist, then of course the function is not differentiable. A simple example of a non-differentiable function is a step function, which looks like this. So at this point, it is not differentiable because the limit, uh, there is no limit that exists at this particular point. If you look at the limit, so that's why the function is not differentiable. Not all continuous functions are differentiable. So if you look at a function like this, this is a continuous function, but it's not differentiable at this point. Okay, once again, because the limit does not exist at this particular point. Now, how do we define the derivative of the function itself? So we talked about derivative in the ith dimension, but now the derivative of a function at x bar is derivative with respect to x1, derivative with respect to x2, derivative with respect to xn. That defines the derivative of a function. And what you would notice is that derivative of a function f, typically you would denote it by gradient with respect to x. This is a function that maps Rn to Rn. <clears throat> okay, I'll pause here for questions. <coughs> So I'm differentiating a function at the ith position. This is the way to define the derivative. And now if I want to differentiate the function with respect to x, I'm going to stack all of these elements. These are all scalar quantity. Because remember, the numerator is scalar, denominator is scalar. So if I divide this, it's, it's a scalar. So this is a scalar quantity. I'm going to stack all the scalar quantity one after another. I get a vector of dimension n. So my gradient of the function with respect to x is actually mapping a point in the Euclidean space to another point in the Euclidean space itself. Okay, let's do an example. So in order to do the example, I need a differentiable function. So Someone please come up with easy differentiable functions so that we can take the derivative. Let's take only two, two elements. Yes, please. X bar is where, where I'm evaluating this gradient. This one? Yeah. 
This is gradient with respect to x. So remember, x is a variable, x bar is a specific point. Okay? So f of x is equal to x square, f of 2 equals to what is that? 4, right? So x bar is 2, and this is what f of x is. Okay? Okay, so I want an easy function. Someone wants to come up with an easy function of two variables. That's too easy, actually. <laughs> I want a bit complicated. Okay, how about I make it exponential of x1, x2? I multiply the two values and take the exponential. Okay, this function is defined everywhere, so I don't think the function uh, becomes undefined at any point of time, at any point in the space. So this is a good enough function. Uh, what's the derivative with respect to x1? So, we will treat x2 as constant. Remember, th in this case, I'm only changing the ith component of x. The other components remains constant. So I'm going to treat x2 as constant, and I'm only going to differentiate with respect to x1. So what do we get? Perfect. Perfect. Everyone agrees with this derivative, this expression of the derivatives? Anybody has any objections, concerns? Okay. So we all agree that this is the derivative of the function f with respect to x1 and this is the derivative of f with respect to x2. So the derivative of the function f with respect to x is 2x1 plus There you go. We have the derivative of the function f. So this is how you differentiate. This is the convention for differentiating the functions of multiple variables. Yes. Yes, this is the derivative with respect to all the n, n variables. Okay, so we'll stack it as a vector of, and remember it's a column vector, it's not a row vector. Okay, so it's stacked as a n cross one vector. Awesome. Now we want to differentiate uh, this, uh, I want to differ further differentiate this function, okay? So now remember this function has multiple components, right? So it maps a Euclidean space into another Euclidean space. So I need to be a bit careful about how do we differentiate uh, such a function. So let's try to understand what the convention is. So I have G, which is a function from Rn to Rm. G of x can be written as G1 of x, Gm of x. 
So g is no longer mapping to a real number. g is mapping to a vector. So I'm going to treat each of this independent component of the vector as a independent function. So this is the first function. This is the last function. So this is my g1 of x, and this is my g2 of x. What are the different ways by which we can differentiate this function? OK, so I'll just uh, tell you what the convention is. The way I'm going to differentiate this, I mean, the way I'm going to represent the derivative of this function is as follows. I'm going to differentiate the first function that becomes my first column. I'll differentiate the second function that becomes my second column. Differentiate the third function that becomes my third column. And differentiate the last function and that becomes my last column. Okay, so every function will be differentiated separately. And then I'm going to stack them as columns of a matrix. What's the dimension of this matrix? n cross m. So each of this is n dimensional vector. And then I have m different columns in the matrix. So it is n cross m matrix. Again, this is the convention. Uh, sometimes in physics and some other other books, this would be treated, this would be a row vector. And here you will have the first row will be gradient of G1, the second row will be gradient of G2, and so on. So depending on the field, conventions may be different, but this is the convention in optimization. Okay, So if you are reading it in physics book, you might have a different convention, so just make sure that you don't apply this convention everywhere. But in this class, this is the convention we'll be applying. Any question? Yes. Keep going for your differential of that. You want to take a further differentiation of this? Uh, good question. So, so let me ask you a question. Uh, when we differentiated the function of, when we differentiated this function, we get a vector. When we differentiate this function, we get a matrix. What will happen if you differentiate a matrix? It's a, it's a tensor, right? So if you have uh, three-dimensional matrices, like you have n cross m cross whatever r, and you stack more and more components like that, then what it becomes is a tensor. And we are not going to consider tensor in this class. <clears throat> but technically, all of this stuff can be extended to arbitrary number of functions, it's just that nobody will use it because the computational power required is quite significant. Has anyone heard of TPUs, tensor processing units? So Google created tensor processing units long time back, I think 10 years back or maybe five years back. Uh, it didn't really work in the market. So anyways, only Google uses it. So they created it, they use it, nobody else uses it. but is something called TPUs, which are arguably better than GPUs, but if nobody uses it, I don't know what better means. <laughs> okay. So we have this function of that maps Rn to, so, sorry, R2 to R2. Let's try to differentiate this function. We'll apply this convention. We'll try to differentiate this function. So this is my G1. This is my g2. And I am going to differentiate the function f twice. Okay, So this is my gradient, the first derivative of f. I am going to take the second derivative of f. 
And I'm going to differentiate this function first. That becomes my first column, and then I'm going to differentiate this function, and it becomes my second column. So who wants to help me with what I need to write here? Please help me. Two. What does what goes here? I have to differentiate this function with respect to x2. X2 minus y, minus y. Zero, because derivative of 2x1 with respect to x2 is zero. OK, so zero plus? Perfect. Now I need to differentiate g2. Correct. Okay, so this is the derivative of, second derivative of the function f. I'm applying this convention here, okay? Now, wasn't there a plus a exponential of x minus 2? Plus. Yeah, so this is x1, x2 exponential of x1, x2. Oh, that's right, that's right. Perfect. Thank you. You are right. Perfect. Anything cool you notice about this matrix? This is in R2 cross 2. What's so cool about this matrix? The transpose of this matrix is itself. Yeah, so it's a symmetric matrix. The transpose of this matrix is the matrix itself. That's going to be an important observation for the rest of this course because we are going to differentiate the function f many, many times throughout the course. Any questions so far? Okay. Looks like the concepts are Clear yeah. so far. What's the next topic? Okay, chain rule. Chain rule. So I have a function h that maps Rn to R. And the way I define h let me make sure I copy it correctly. No. Ah, that's right. So I have three functions and then I define my h of x as g of f of x and this is also written as g composition f x. This is the symbol for composition. So g composed f.
So we have learned how to differentiate this function. We have learned how to differentiate this function. Now we need to learn how to differentiate this function. So the convention here is gradient of h of x is gradient of f of x, gradient of g, and this is evaluated at f of x. Let's look at it. What is this? This is supposed to be a vector. Gradient of h of x is a vector in n dimension. What is gradient of fx? n times m. And this is a vector in rm. So dimensionally, this looks correct. So what we get is a matrix which comes from gradient of f and this matrix then gets multiplied to another matrix. But remember gradient of g here is evaluated at f of x. Okay. Any question so far? This is also just a convention. This is how uh, we define the derivative of h of x. And you can actually calculate, and this is exactly what it would turn out to be. So I'll leave it up to you to do it as an exercise uh, at home. The next topic I want to talk about is mean value theorem. So I, I, I don't know if you have heard of, of this, but uh, let's consider this function from R to R, and it is differentiable. And I have two points, x and y. Then there exists an alpha, or let me make it psi, between x and y, such that How many of you have seen this theorem, mean value theorem before? Okay, some of you have seen it. It's something you study in calculus one or calculus two. I'm sure everyone has studied it in the second year of their engineering curriculum, but they have forgotten about it. So I'm reminding you of this theorem. Anybody who has done engineering has not, has, has seen mean value theorem for sure. It's just not possible that you have not seen it. Okay. So now we want to extend this mean value theorem to functions of multiple dimensions. So let me write down. The expression is fairly similar, but uh, R into R, it is differentiable. X and Y are in Rn. 
then there exists an alpha between 0 and 1 such that f of y minus f of x So this is the mean value theorem for functions of multiple dimensions. Okay, so I have a, uh, I have two points, x, y. So alpha x plus one minus alpha y. This lies somewhere along this line. Okay, somewhere on this particular line. Alpha x plus one minus alpha y is going to lie. And so when you take the differ difference between the function value at y and function value at x, what you have is this derivative evaluated at a specific point on this line. Then you take transpose and then you multiply it by the difference y minus x itself. So you have a, this is a scalar, this is a scalar, so this side is scalar. This is a n-dimensional vector, this is an n-dimensional vector, and we take a, inner product between the two vectors, we get the scalar, okay, that we are looking for. So that's mean value theorem. Um, any questions on this? No? Then we'll talk about Taylor series expansion. One thing to remember is that this alpha actually depends on the value of x and y. So for different values of x and y, you will have different values of alpha. So alpha changes depending on where you pick x and where you pick y. Taylor series. Okay, so now we have a function f which is multiple times differentiable. So it's not differentiable once, but you can differentiate it again and again. Okay, there are all kinds of corner cases and I don't want to talk about corner cases in this class. If you take more advanced optimization classes, then you will talk about all kinds of corner cases where the function is twice differentiable, but not third time differentiable and so on and so forth. Uh, we are going to talk about very nice functions like exponential functions, logarithmic functions, which are differentiable infinite number of times, okay? So let's look at how you define. So let me remind you what Taylor series for R to R looks like. So F of, so I have a point X, I have a point Y, and I know a lot about the value of function f at this point and the derivative of the function f at this point and the de second derivative of the function f at this point. And for some, for some reason, I want to figure out what the value of f of y is based on all the information I have. So Taylor series gives us that method. The function evaluated at y is equal to the function evaluated at x plus
Okay, so this is this is how you. Uh, so if you look at the right hand side here, uh, you are evaluating the function at x. You are evaluating the derivative of the function f at x. You are evaluating the second derivative of the function f at x, and so on and so forth. Third derivative, fourth derivative, fifth derivative, and so on. And all you are doing is multiplying it by y minus x, y minus x square, y minus x cube, y minus x raised to 4, and so on. And of course, you have to have this factor of, this is 1 over 1 factorial, 1 over 2 factorial, 1 over 3 factorial, 1 over 4 factorial, and so on. That gives you what is known as a Taylor series expansion of the function around x. And you can get the value of f at y based on all this information that you have. Now what do we do when you have function that goes from R into R? Okay, yes. When you wrote the mean value for the single dimension, the psi needs to be in the closed set between x and y? Yeah, it needs to be in the closed set between. If the first term in this Taylor series, uh, derivative of f of x is replaced with f of psi. Right. But then you don't have all these terms. You don't have these terms in the mean value theorem. No, I'm just trying to see like how is this value because if you replace that f of x by f of psi. Yes. And that whole first term becomes f of y minus f of x. Exactly. And then f of x and f of x will be cancelled out and then all of the remaining terms don't make sense. I don't understand. So, so mean value theorem was f of y equals to f of x plus gradient of f of psi times y minus x. That's it. Yeah. Now, if you uh, exactly. So, uh, the first, the first, uh, uh, the second term sorry, in the Taylor series, yes, this is equal to f of y minus f of x, right? No, it's not. This is equal to f of y minus f of x. Oh, this, so I see what the confusion is. So depending on x and y, there is a c between x and y. Yes. But it doesn't necessarily mean that c is arbitrary. You cannot pick c. C gets decided on the basis of what x and y you pick. Okay. And c is in between x and y. Okay. Yeah. OK. so. So this is, an, this is a first order approximation. And if you don't want any approximation, I mean, sorry, this is not, a, this is not an approximation. This is an exact equality here. But uh, uh, this c is different from this x that we are using here. This c is not something that you can pick independently. OK? So the Taylor series is more of like a general? Case. It's a general case, yeah. I mean, they both are used in different contexts. So if you need an infinite series, then you use Taylor series. If you don't need an infinite series and you want some sort of approximation, you use mean value theorem. But you're stuck at the approximation at that point. Uh, yeah, so there what you would generally do is you will pick some point, midpoint between x and y, or you'll pick x, or you'll pick, pick y, but then that becomes an approximation. There are various reasons why you would study uh, some of these uh, expressions, and it will become clear as we delve deeper into the optimization algorithms. Any other question? OK. So, so let's look at Taylor series for functions of multiple dimensions. So remember that when you have multiple dimensions, this becomes a, this becomes a uh, vector, and this becomes a matrix. And there is, this one loses its meaning because what is square of a vector, right? So we don't know what a square of a vector is. So let's see how it's defined. F is a function from Rn to R. So remember, gradient of F is a function from R rn to rn and second derivative of f is a function from rn 
so R n cross n. Okay. This is the Taylor series expansion for functions that takes as input a vector. And then you can notice that similarity and differences between this Taylor series and that Taylor series. Yes. Can you write one more term so I understand the trend? The, 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 the other term? Yeah. Okay. I can write it down, but it will not get used okay. ever. So this is a tensor product. So you have a three, this is a three dimensional matrix. You will multiply y minus x along one dimension. Then you will multiply y minus x along the second dimension. And then you will multiply y minus x along the third dimension. And then you can keep taking more and more terms. Y minus X? I mean, oh, I mean the, that term. This one. Yeah. Okay. This is Y minus X transpose, so this is N, this is an N dimensional vector transpose N cross N vector multiplied by N dimensional vector. So this is a scalar. Okay, vector transpose matrix times a vector, it's a scalar. This is a scalar, this is a scalar, what we get is a scalar. Kind of, sort of. No, like why would we not take more terms? No, 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 this is an infinite series. There are infinite number of terms here. But you said the third one's never used. Well, uh, in, in, the, in the optimization class, we will realize many a times that we can take the approximation, so we want to optimize a function we can take an approximation of that function and optimize it and try to reapproximate the new function. And that's how most of the optimization algorithms work. And typically, you would either, uh, you would either do the first order approximation of the function and optimize that, or you would do the second order function and optimize that, but you will never do the third order function and try to optimize it. And we'll get into the nitty gritties of why that is that is done in that particular way. Uh, more importantly, I think to, to give you a preview of what's going to come, it's much easier to uh, take the inverse of a matrix like this than to take an inverse of a matrix like this. So that's roughly what the reasoning is for just using either first order approximation or second order approximation, but not go further into the Taylor series expansion. <clears throat> Any other question? Yeah. I want to know in this area, uh, y minus x is about uh, vector of one times n? Yeah, uh, n times one. Oh, n times one. Yeah, it's always n times one. This is r n, right? So it's implicitly n, n times one. Okay. These are all column vectors. Scalar, column vector, transpose, column vector, 
column vector transpose, so this is a row vector multiplied by matrix multiplied by a column vector, and so on. For, for the third term, I'm trying to understand how you got that from this one? the original Taylor series. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not uh, deriving that from here. This derivation comes from doing all the tedious math for differentiation and how exactly would this term turn out to be. So it's a bit complicated. But, the, uh, but you can go through the derivative, I mean, you can go through the uh, uh, derivation at home if you wanted to, it's there in, in the book. Any other question? So the second term will certainly can be regarded as a kind of inner product. So I want to This one is an inner product. Yeah, so the, this one is also, I mean, maybe using a matrix as, as the, the, I think this can also be I, I know what you're trying to say. Yes, this can be regarded as an inner product, but it requires this particular function to be convex. Yeah, so I mean, if the, the later one, for example, the last term in, can also be regarded as an inner product. Of something. Well, technically, when you, th up to this, it's okay to call it inner product. When you come here, then you have to call it a tensor product. It's no longer an inner product. Inner product is between two variables or two vectors or two objects. Now here you have three objects. So you have to call it a tensor product. You can't call it an inner product anymore. Okay, perfect. So I am going to uh, again introduce another minor notation. So sometimes during the optimization class, We would need a Taylor series expansion of f of x plus d, or maybe an approximation of f of x plus d. And we are going to write it as and we are going to write it like this. And what is this small o notation? Order. Yeah, it's the order notation. What this basically means is if d is a small variable, so if d is not too large in comparison to x, then the norm of d will be very, very small. Norm of d square is going to be even smaller. And so this term, which is the higher order terms that appears here, these terms are negligible. And when these terms are negligible, we write it as small o of norm of d square. Okay? So this will be mainly used in approximation. The first order approximation is, now I'm going to write the approximation notation. And the second order approximation would be So whenever I'm ignoring the higher orders of D, so this is the first order approximation, so I'm ignoring the second term onwards. This is the second order approximation, so I'm ignoring the third term onwards. I mean the third order expressions of D. Okay, any questions so far? No? Perfect. So what did we study today? We studied continuous functions. We studied differentiable functions. We studied how do we differentiate functions. Then we studied mean value theorem and then we studied Taylor series expansion. Okay, yeah. 
can you explain the geometric meaning of Taylor series like how the approximation is working like f of x if you take two points x and y like right yeah. let's let me show you uh, but I can only show it in uh, when x is one dimensional because higher order is <laughs> beyond my capability <laughs> Okay, so I have this function f of x, this is my x, this is my f of x. I'll pick a point x here, let me call it x bar and this is x bar plus d. So I have a function which is a bit curvy function. It has some curve. It's not like straight line or linear or anything like that. I'm sitting at x bar and I'm looking at x bar plus d. Okay, a little bit further away from x bar. This is my f of x bar plus d and this is f of x bar and I'm sitting here and I'm approximating what this value is going to look like. So what's the first order expansion saying? I need to look at the gradient of the function f and then take it, uh, take the inner product with respect to d. So the gradient of the function f at x bar is basically this, this line. So this is the gradient. So gradient is basically the slope of the function at that particular point. So I multiply the function, I multiply the gradient with d and I look at this f of x plus gradient of fx transpose d. That's this point. Okay, so I am approximating it. I think it's a good approximation, but it's still a little bit off. Then I look at this particular expression. So I'm here, but then I have to add a, more, add a correction term, a further correction term that takes into account the second derivative of the function at this point. Okay, and then that gets multiplied to, in this case, d square. So this is my distance d. This particular function has a positive curvature. So if you look at the second derivative of the function here, it will be positive because the function is going like this. So the slope is increasing. So this is the slope here. If you look at the slope here, that's much, much, much steeper slope. So this function must have a positive curvature. So the second derivative is going to be positive. I'm going to multiply it by d square, and I'm going to divide it by two factorial. So the estimate will move up a little bit, and this will be my second estimate. Okay, and as we go further and further along the Taylor series expansion, our estimates will become better and better, and I'll eventually reach this point. Okay. Awesome, so that's pretty much it for this class. Next class, we are gonna talk about convex functions, convex sets, everything convex. And then we'll talk about optimization. Thank you so much for your attention.